Tonight, President Biden says the U.S. has not verified Russian claims that they are partially pulling back some troops. But has America considered all of its options to prevent a war? I'll debate the role of NATO in all of this with former U.S. ambassador to Russia, Michael McFaul. And the January 6th committee subpoenas Mark Fincham. He's a big lie Trump supporter, and he's running to become the top election official in Arizona. He joins a growing list of election deniers who want to oversee future elections. We'll introduce you to a few. Plus, right-wing media is absolutely furious that the rest of the media won't cover special counsel John Durham's latest court filing. They say it exposes a shocking Clinton campaign scandal. It doesn't. If you'd like to know what on earth they're on about, stick around. We'll break it down for you. Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. What do you do if you're a county clerk in charge of local elections and are blocked from overseeing those elections because you've been accused of having participated in an election security breach? Oh, and you also deny the results of the 2020 presidential election to boot. Why, of course, you launch a campaign to run all of the elections in your state. That's what's happening right now in Colorado. Meet Tina Peters. She's the clerk for Colorado's Mesa County, as well as an outspoken proponent of false fraud claims about the 2020 election. And she told former Trump strategist Steve Bannon yesterday that she's running to be Colorado's Secretary of State to, quote, restore trust in the election process. I want to keep elections local. I want to fight against the Biden and the radical left to take over our vote. And I am the wall between your vote and nationalized elections. They are coming after me because I'm standing in their way of truth, transparency, and election held closest to the people. Okay, then. Uh, it seems like Peters herself, though, has a bit of a problem with transparency, given that she's the subject of an investigation into a security breach of Mesa County's voting equipment. According to a lawsuit filed by Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold, in May 2021, a copy of the voting equipment's hard drive was made with security logs showing Peters accessed the area where the system was located. Just two days later, the suit says Peters allowed an unauthorized person to participate in the secure process for updating the voting system software, where a video recording was made of sensitive information, including passwords, to access those systems. The following August, those passwords appeared on right-wing social media sites and the conspiracy blog Gateway Pundit. The suit claims that, quote, it appears that the passwords were then used by an as yet unknown person or persons to access the equipment. And that's not all. Around the same time, Peters was at a conference in South Dakota hosted by Mike Lindell. Yeah, the My Pillow guy. Colorado Public Radio reports that at that conference, a speaker presented what he claims were those files from Mesa County, though Peters denied the data came from her office. So from where? Mesa County, Arizona? Peters reportedly traveled to an undisclosed location in Texas afterwards, citing threats she'd received in the wake of the Secretary of State's investigation. But a Colorado paper found that those emails were mostly supportive, with no evidence of any actual threats. So much for that truth and transparency she says she wants to restore. And here's another twist. Peters, who vehemently and falsely maintains that the 2020 election was stolen from Trump, as county clerk... She signed off on a routine required audit in Mesa County that found no discrepancies between 2020 paper ballots and what the machines tabulated. She signed off on it. Peters was stripped of her ability to oversee Mesa County's 2021 elections, and the Secretary of State there in Colorado is trying to prevent her from overseeing this year's midterm elections too. Peters calls that a power grab and has denied any wrongdoing. She did not immediately return any NBC News requests for comment. Oh, and last week, Peters was arrested as officers tried to carry out a subpoena in a separate investigation into an illegal recording she allegedly took of a subordinate's court hearing. She was charged with obstruction and released on bail. But she's far from the only 2020 election denier currently vying to run their state's elections. And it's thrown a little-known office, that of Secretary of State, into a national political spotlight that it hasn't seen probably since this woman, Catherine Harris, ran elections in Florida during 2000's Bush v. Gore. Right now, more than 20 people who dispute President Joe Biden's victory are running to become Secretary of State in 18 different states, according to a nonpartisan group 
that tracks those races. At least eight of them are forming a big lie propelling alliance called the Coalition of America First Secretary of State Candidates. Among them is Congressman Jody Heiss, who's running for the Republican Party Secretary of State nomination in Georgia. Heiss objected to the counting of Georgia's electoral votes on January the 6th. Heiss tweeted on that day, this is our 1776 moment. He voted against awarding the Congressional Medal of Honor to police officers who defended the Capitol. He's backed by Trump and is facing off against fellow Republican Brad Raffensperger. Just imagine how the 2020 election might have ended if it was Jody Heiss who had answered that phone call instead of Brad Raffensperger when Trump called and asked that 11,000 votes in Georgia be found in his favor. And look, that's why these races for Secretary of State have suddenly become so important. What happens if officials like Jody Heiss or Tina Peters are in charge of state and federal elections in 2024? You won't even need an armed insurrection to overturn the election result. And on that note, let's not forget, with everything else going on, that the investigation into 2020 election subversion and coup plots isn't over. Today, the January 6th committee issued six new subpoenas regarding efforts to send false electors to Congress, including Mark Fincham, the election-denying, QAnon-indulging, self-proclaimed oath keeper, who is now the Trump-backed candidate for, yes, you guessed it, Secretary of State in Arizona. Joining me now is Georgia State Representative B. Wynn, a Democrat running for Secretary of State in Georgia and former Republican Congressman Joe Walsh, who's since left his party. He's now host of the podcast White Flag with Joe Walsh and the author of F Silence. Thank you both for joining me on the show. Uh, Representative Wynn, let me start with you. You're running for Secretary of State in Georgia. On the Republican side, you have challenger Jody Heiss, who, as I mentioned, is an election denier, objected to the certification of the vote on January 6th. He has Trump's endorsement. You obviously want to beat whichever Republican candidate you're up against. Who's a more worrying prospect? Brad Raffensperger, who did the right thing last time, but these days is talking more and more about election fraud, or Jody Heiss, who's simply detached from reality? Look, you know, I think that we have an alarming trend going on with the Secretary of State's race here in Georgia and across the country. And I want to be very clear that with Jody Hines, we have an outright election denier who is running on the big lie. And then on the other hand, we have a Secretary of State who has backed a state voter suppression bill. And the latest call from Secretary of State Raffensperger is to place state troopers at every single polling precinct in Georgia. And I question whether or not wow. he cares to understand the history of how straight state troopers were used to suppress and intimidate black voters. But we have a much better choice here in Georgia. And so what I don't want to do is talk about how either one of them how either one of them would be worse or better, but talk about what's really at stake here, which is both candidates inherently have been supporting anti-democratic laws and anti-democratic norms. Mm -hmm. That's a very fair point. Joe, we are seeing a surge in funding for Secretary of State races in key states, including in Georgia. According to the Brennan Center, it's tripled compared to 2018. Your old party is taking these Secretary of State and other local races very seriously, encouraged by Steve Bannon and co. Are Democrats taking it seriously enough? No, Mehdi, they're not. And again, I'm, I'm going to be a broken record and say this. Everybody who is not part of the Republican Party base, Democrats, progressives, moderates, and reasonable conservatives, need to wake the hell up. You and I talk all the time, Mehdi, about how the base of my former political party has become radicalized. I come from that base. That base has become radicalized. But here's the thing, Mehdi. These Republicans now running for state and local offices are part of that base. They come from that radicalized base. If, if people think Republicans in Washington, D.C. are crazy, they don't know the half of it. Republicans state and locally are even crazier. They're more radicalized. And I'll tell you what, Mehdi, imagine 30 or 40 Marjorie Taylor Greens or Lowen, Lauren Boebert's in charge of state elections as secretaries yeah. of state around this country. That's what we're heading toward. It is very scary. And the alternative to them 
uh, is Brad Raffensperger in places like Georgia. Uh, Representative Wynn, you mentioned a moment ago, you know, he's got his own issues. He supported the Georgia voter suppression law. Uh, he's critical of democratic measures to try and protect voting rights at the federal level. Uh, he slammed democratic attempts at the national level to try and pass a law. And then the very next day, uh, he called for his own federal election measure. Uh, have a listen to what he's been saying. But that's one thing that I do think we need is to make sure that nationwide there should be a law that bans, you know, bar ballot harvesting. I don't think that ballot harvesting is good. The only person that should touch your ballot is you and the election official. Are you worried that because he did the right thing, let's be clear, he did the right thing in January 2021 and stood up to Trump, and he became famous for that. Are you worried that a lot of independents in your state and even some Democrats will say, look, Raffensperger, he's the right person. He's in between Jody Heiss and B. Wynn. Oh, absolutely. What I'm concerned about is that the bar has been set so incredibly low. He did the right yeah. thing This in per this particular situation. He followed the law. That should be the bare minimum of any secretary of state or any elected official who has taken an oath of office. And so what we are looking at is because the bar is set so low, um, we are choosing to look the other way because when he is talking about things like ballot harvesting, that is part of the big lie. What they are pushing forward is propagated by lies and continues to sow those seeds of doubt that have been inherently dangerous to our democracy. That is what is fueling this base, this idea that the election was somehow stolen, that people are violating laws. And again, when he talks about ballot harvesting, he has no evidence that this is occurring in the state of Georgia. Yeah, very good point. Um, Joe, let me ask you about your former party again, because you have Jody Heiss, a man who voted to overturn the election even after an armed insurrection had taken place running in Georgia. You have a self-proclaimed oath keeper, Mark Fincham, in Arizona. You have someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene, a lot of recent reporting about how her blessing is what Republicans across the state are looking for. She's the second most influential endorser after Donald Trump. And then you think about people like Mitch McConnell, or Mitt Romney, <laughs> what are they thinking? They know that their party's been taken over by crazies. Many they know, and most of them keep silent. And and what a what a what a pitiful shame that is. Look, none of this, Medi, is a surprise. Donald Trump is the leader of the party. Hello, is it a surprise that we've got a Marjorie Taylor Greene, a Lauren Boebert, a Paul Gosar? But it, but again, the warning that every Democrat and reasonable person in the middle needs to understand is. The base is radicalized, and these Republicans at the state and local levels, man, you ain't seen nothing yet. They're yes. running to be secretaries of state, and they are. there's no difference between these candidates, Mehdi, and Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene. And they will be managing and running elections in this country. Democrats need to wake up. You're you're right. Some of these people running at the local level make Bobert and Green and Gosar look almost moderate. They're so out there. Um, Representative Wynn, last word to you. You're almost out of time. Some people might say you're running with a negative campaign. Don't vote for the Republicans. What's your positive message? What do you plan to do as Secretary of State briefly if you win? I'm running on a pro-democracy platform. That means free and fair elections for everybody in the state of Georgia, no matter what side of the aisle that you belong to. And we're facing really big threats here in Georgia and across the country. And I think the positive news is that we are people, we are the people that make up our democracy. So when we're talking about safeguarding our democracy, it requires and empowers all of us citizens to participate in the process and fight for free and fair elections. And that is what I'm running on. We'll have to leave it there. Georgia State Representative B. Wynn and former Congressman Joe Walsh, thank you both for your time. Appreciate it. Coming up next, there was the Cold War. We are on the precipice of a hot war. And in between, it seems there could be a cyber war. The Ukrainian government says the Defense Ministry's website and those of uh, major banks have been knocked offline. No word on the cause, but it's exactly the kind of thing you don't want to happen ahead of a ground incursion that's said to be imminent. On the other side of this break, I'll discuss NATO's role in responding to a Russian invasion with former U.S. Ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall. Lots to debate and discuss. Stay with us. Will he or won't he? Last Friday, U.S. officials were warning that the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, could launch an invasion of Ukraine at any moment. 
with 130,000 troops surrounding the U.S. ally on three sides. But after meeting with the German foreign minister in Moscow on Tuesday, Putin announced that he was pulling some Russian troops out of an attack position to let diplomatic talks continue. The head of NATO said he has yet to see any sign of de-escalation. U.S. officials say they're still reviewing the Russian announcement. Nevertheless, there's a sliver for hope in this news. Can a war the U.S. said was imminent now be avoided? And is there a way to permanently diffuse this crisis without indulging Putin's imperial ambitions? One of the main sticking points for Russia is Ukraine's longstanding ambition to join NATO. That's the U.S.-led Cold War-era military alliance created to contain the Soviet Union. You see, under the NATO charter, an attack on one nation is an attack on all. And after Russia invaded eastern Ukraine in 2014 under the guise of protecting ethnic Russians there, joining NATO looked like a pretty good idea to a lot of Ukrainians. In 2019, Ukraine's parliament even added an amendment to their constitution, committing the country to join NATO. Putin argues that having a NATO member on its border, on Russia's border, would be a provocation to war. Publicly, U.S. leaders support Ukraine joining NATO, but privately, they know it's not happening anytime soon. Listen to President Biden speaking today. I will not send American servicemen to fight in Ukraine. We have supplied the Ukrainian military with equipment to help them defend themselves. And make no mistake, the United States will defend every inch of NATO territory with the full force of American power. An attack against one NATO country is an attack against all of us. And the United States' commitment to Article 5 is sacrosanct. In other words, if you want the benefits of NATO membership, you have to actually be a member, which raises the question, what would it hurt for the West to put off Ukrainian membership in NATO or take it off the table altogether? How harmful would that be? How beneficial would that be? Earlier this month, Republican Senator Josh Hawley, yes, the insurrection fist raise guy, joined a host of other Republicans in calling for the U.S. to drop its support for Ukrainian membership of NATO. Now, yes, Josh Hawley helped incite an insurrection and almost always argues in bad faith. But the argument about NATO membership is a long-standing and legitimate one. And if it might stop a war, why not consider it? Yet here's how White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki responded. Well, if you are just digesting Russian misinformation and parroting Russian talking points, uh, you are not aligned uh, with uh, long-standing bipartisan American values. I'm sorry. It is outrageous to try and shut down debate about NATO by accusing people of being Kremlin stooges. And if it is a Russian talking point, why did a Ukrainian official say it just this past Sunday? The Ukrainian ambassador to the UK told the BBC that his nation could be flexible on its NATO plans if that helped ease tensions with Russia. On Monday, though, that ambassador walked those comments back, saying he had been misunderstood. Still, a couple of weeks ago, when I said on Twitter that, yes, Josh Hawley might have a point about NATO in Ukraine, if nothing else... I got pilloried for it, including by Michael McFall, the former U.S. ambassador to Russia and an MSNBC contributor, who said, quote, if you find yourself agreeing with both Putin and Hawley in your analysis on Ukraine, maybe time to reconsider your assumptions. It's kind of an unfair thing to say in an argument. I mean, is his side of the argument the side of Mike Pompeo and John Bolton? But Ambassador McFall, to be fair to him, withdrew his remark and agreed to come on tonight on this show to have a proper substantive good faith discussion with me about the Ukraine crisis and NATO's role in it. And he joins me now. Uh, Ambassador McFall, thank you for joining me on the show tonight. Before we go any further, we can both agree that Vladimir Putin is a monstrous and murderous leader and that if Russia invades Ukraine, the fault for that will lie with Russia. We agree on that. So now we agree on that. Let's talk about NATO's role in all this, because there is an interesting argument to be had here. What is your response, Ambassador, to the Russian president saying NATO should not seek to create new divisions and, quote, we believe that the plans of expanding NATO are contrary to this logic. Why sow the seeds of distrust? Well, I think all countries, all sovereign countries, should have the right to aspire to ally with the countries that they want, uh, seek military assistance short of, uh, of treaties, and no country should veto uh, the ability of those countries to do that. That would be my response to Vladimir Putin. Now, that doesn't mean that NATO has an obligation to accept other countries. And it's my analytic view that as long as Russian soldiers are occupying 
Russia, uh, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, the, the NATO alliance will never vote because they have to vote uh, in unison, uh, uh, not, yes. not just we can't decide. They'll never vote to bring those countries in because of the risk of war. But it would be wrong to give Putin a veto over any country's ability to pursue its national security interests as it sees fit. So you said that would be your response to President Putin, but the Russian president I was quoting wasn't Vladimir Putin, it was Boris Yeltsin. He said those words about it being contrary to logic and divisive, speaking to Bill oh, Clinton tricky, in Maddie. Budapest. Tricky, tricky, tricky. I got to, you're breaking no, in no, and no, out. No, sorry. No. But you, you actually, I, that's I, don't, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be tricky. The point about the Yeltsin no, quote tricky. is, it, it goes back to, the point I was trying to make is, 1994, the president of Russia is saying this. Change the names, it's the president of Russia. This is how the Washington Post reported on it, saying Yeltsin warned that plans Clinton supports for an expansion of NATO threatened to make an enemy of Russia. That was 28 years ago, well before Vladimir Putin emerges on the Russian political scene. He's a local official in St. Petersburg at the time. Yeah, Mehdi, and I actually, so we're going back in history. I wrote a book, I think in 2003, on Russia NATO relation Russia US relations uh, one of the chapters on NATO expansion and it's called NATO N A T O a four letter word uh, yes that's absolutely right um, um, now uh, you know Russia Yeltsin was against it Gorbachev was against it Putin was against it Medvedev was against it that's fine uh, but they don't get to veto uh, what happens especially in countries that they annexed remember that Medi it was Russian Empire right they didn't even try to hide it. They didn't even call it a republic. It was a Russian empire. It was a Soviet empire. They annexed countries. They subjugated them with communist uh, regimes in Poland and Hungary and, and throughout the Warsaw Pact. So we, when those countries are liberated can... from Moscow, why are we surprised that they might want to ally with other countries? And why should we give Moscow, their former imperial masters, veto power over what they get to do regarding their own sovereignty? That's the first In thing. Theory, the second I agree thing, with you. though, should... this is important. Okay. Can I finish, just finish yes. this second really important point? NATO, the, the, the reaction to NATO being a big issue or not in U.S.-Russian relations has been a variable over 30 years. It has not been a constant. Because uh, you just quoted Boris Yeltsin from 1994, but go quote him from 1997. When he, when he signed the NATO-Russia pact. Go look at that pact and how cooperative it is and when he says all nations should do this. Or go look at what President Medvedev said at the NATO summit in Portugal in 2010. I was there. Go look at what he said. He said, we have no hostility with NATO. We want to cooperate on missile defense with NATO. It's, you don't have to believe that, me. You can go Google it. So in other no, words, no, this is not with a constant we, we, over 30 hold years. Hold on, it's a can... variable. You, you agree. You, you cited 2010 and 2008. 2008, Ambassador. Putin warns NATO over expansion. That was the headline in The Guardian. That was Putin's response to the idea of allowing Ukraine yes. in. He called it a direct threat to Russia. Uh, in 1999, we go back, you said 97. We can play, you know, as you say, it's not consistent. Putin says to the Financial Times, we are concerned over the process of NATO expansion. My point in this discussion is not to say Russia should have a veto. I agree with you. Russia shouldn't have a veto. My point is, is that it's unfair to suggest that this is some sort of new or weird argument that Russia Russians don't actually believe this stuff. You have a listen to what you said on Deadline uh, Washington on MSNBC yesterday. I want to play a clip. Have a listen to something that you said. I think Putin is winning, and I don't even want to call it the information war. I want to call it the framing of this conflict. How many times in the last several weeks have you heard Americans from the left and the right, by the way, saying this is all about NATO expansion, going back to what Gorbachev said to Jim Baker 30 years ago, and basically saying we should give Putin what he wants? Those are huge information victories for Vladimir Putin. So you say in that quote, you talk about this giving Putin, winning Putin what he wants, left and right. I mean, the problem is this, as you know better than me, because you're the expert here, is a legitimate longstanding debate. You know better than anyone the arguments about Gorbachev. You don't have to agree with them. But Gorbachev, as recently as 2014, was saying NATO violated the spirit of our agreements. Uh, you have Mary Surratt, who I'm sure you know, post-Cold War historian at John Hopkins, literally wrote the book about some of this. She says, and I quote, the open door policy is the one that maximizes friction with Russia 
Russia, which has culminated in the crisis we have now. I don't think Vladimir Putin is primarily interested in historical accuracy, but I believe he's genuinely aggrieved at the way the post-Cold War order includes no stake for Russia. Is she wrong? Man, I'm sorry, you're breaking up so I can barely hear what you're saying. But let me let me say a few things about what I think about NATO expansion. Um, it, it is, has it caused tension in U.S.-Russian relations and U.S.-Soviet relations for a long time? The answer is yes. That's not a reason to say we're going to change our policy. That's the first thing. Number two, the valence of this issue, the, the importance of this issue in U.S.-Russia relations varies. It's not a constant. You're suggesting it's been a constant. It's not. When, when Putin was first uh, about to become president, he himself said in London, Russia should join NATO. So how can the guy that says that Russia should join NATO say, well, it's always been a threat? That's just not the way the history is been. No, no, come on. In come on, Ambassador. That's not inconsistent for Russia to say we want to join NATO. They don't join NATO. And then they feel that they're being threatened by a NATO that doesn't include them. Again, I'm not agreeing with Putin, but it's not inconsistent to say those two things. And look, I'll concede what you're saying, that it's not a consistent pattern. But it's about why are we in this crisis now? Uh, I want you to have a listen to Bill Burns, uh, the current director of the CIA in a memo back in 2008 when he was ambassador to Russia. He hey, wrote, Maddie, and I quote... You to finish my answers on your show? This is really, uh, this is hard for me to interact here. Uh, you don't let me finish the answers. I would appreciate the chance to finish the answers, okay? Please I think do. that's a more respectful way than, than just throwing all these quotes uh, from people. And, and with all Please due respect, do. I can't hear them because there's so much static. I so, apologize for the audio. I'm not, I'm not responsible for the audio, but please finish your point. So why do you think it's a crisis now? Let me answer that question. You said that. Do you, have, did you have a show or did anybody, was anybody talking about the threat of NATO expansion in 2009? How about 2010? How about 2011, 12, 13? I, I, you know, you, you're finding quotes from the past. I dare you to find major television discussions about NATO expansion during all that time. When did it so occur I, again? Can I, can I when, when did it occur again? It occur, occurred after Putin annexed Crimea. It occurred after he supported separatists in Ukraine, and he blamed NATO and Nazis for sparking that. So I just think it's important. You can have your interpretation, but from my interpretation, Agreed. it's always been democracy. It's democratic movements that threaten Putin, uh, not NATO. And the second thing to remember about NATO, for your listeners, NATO has never attacked the Soviet Union or Russia. Never. So when Putin claims that NATO threatens him, please remember that NATO members on his border feel equally threatened by Russia. Agreed. We agree on that. We agree on that. So can I answer you? Because I, I, I know you're, you're objecting to quotes, but you're asking me a question. You said, when were we talking about it in 09 and that period? So in 2008, just for our viewers, just to put, respond no, to your I point. Said 09, Bill, 09. Can I, the history study is important. Let me tell you why the yes, history Yes, I agree. Can I, can I finish? <laughs> I'm asking you a very long answer. Can I respond? Can I respond? Um, I know. Bill I Burns and... You're not, you, you're not letting me speak, Ambassador. I let you, well, you gave a very long answer there, and you asked me a question about 2009. I chose 2009 deliberately because before 2009, Vladimir Putin and Russia invaded Georgia. They invaded Georgia, and that ended yes. the debate about NATO expansion to so, Georgia. That's so can I point. ask my question, and it will be relevant? Can I, can I respond to all of the, what you're saying? You've said a lot of stuff. Just on one point, then we'll move on. In 2008, Bill Burns, who's the current CIA director, was ambassador to Russia, and he wrote a memo to Condoleezza Rice, and he said, Ukrainian entry into NATO is the brightest of all red lines for the Russian elite. He said, this is what he said at the time, he said, I've not met anyone in Russia who doesn't think this is a direct challenge to Russian interests. He said, if we open NATO's door to Ukraine, it would create fertile soil for Russian meddling in Crimea and eastern Ukraine. So respectfully, is that not a resp is that, does that not deal with some of what you're saying, is that they were people were warning, very respected people in positions like your own were saying, this is going to end badly if we go down this road. Is he wrong? No, Mehdi, of course he's not wrong. Bill Burns is a very smart guy. He's not right about everything. By the way, there are Russians that, that agree in Ukrainian membership. And by the way, I argued in the 1990s for Russian membership, uh, vehemently, democratic Russian membership. The point you're missing, in my view, and I, I can tell we're not going to agree on this. Your point they're missing is there was not a change in official policy 
in Brussels in the last several months. There was not a change in Washington about NATO, about Ukraine joining Fair. NATO in the last several months. I hosted Vladimir Zelensky here at Stanford six months ago. He was deeply disappointed in the reaction he got from Washington and Brussels about Ukraine's NATO aspirations. And sometimes in diplomacy, for peace, you agree to disagree, and ambiguity is a part of effective diplomacy. Imagine if we were having this conversation about Taiwan now, and you are pressing, is Taiwan a real country or not? Ambassador, tell me, is Taiwan a real country or not? The whole reason we kept the peace about Taiwan is because we've all agreed to the fiction that we're not going to press that question. And that's why from 2009 to now, there was not a serious debate. Maddie, I was in the government for five years. In every single meeting between President Medvedev and Prime Minister Putin and President Putin, I do not remember one argument about NATO expansion, okay. not a single argument. And the reason okay. we're having this conversation now is because Vladimir Putin defined this crisis this way. Vladimir Putin, not Joe Biden and not NATO, put 150,000 troops on Agreed. the border of NATO. That's why we're having this debate. And we're not talking about annexation. We're not talking about the illegal recognition of country parts of Georgia. And that, tragically, is what Putin wants us to argue about. OK, so just we're almost out of time. I've got one more question for you, but I agree with a lot of what you just said. You're right to raise the timeline. Just just to be clear, Ambassador, the reason I wanted to have this discussion with you is not because we have to agree on everything. My own personal issue is I want to be able to have a legitimate discussion about NATO's role. You don't have to agree about it, but I think you and I can both agree that it's not Russian talking points to have that discussion. That was the point of this discussion, and, and viewers can make up their own minds. Last question to you on the actual war position. It's strange for me that the position of many in the D.C. foreign policy community and in the Biden administration is we won't concede on issues like NATO, but we won't go to war to protect Ukraine either. And it feels a little bit like the equivalent of a kid in the playground getting bullied for his lunch money. And we say, whatever you do, don't give him your lunch money. And he says, well, are you going to protect me from the bully? Are you going to fight him? And we say, if he hits you, you're on your own, but don't give him your lunch money. Welcome to the real world, Nettie, of diplomacy and, and great power politics. I, you know, I, I, yes. Is it hypocr hypocr hypocritical? Yes. Uh, is this the way that, that, that we try to avoid war? Yes. Um, by the way, I disagree with your characterization of, of Washington. We actually have a, a pretty healthy debate about NATO. We have progressives. We have, you know, Senator Hawley. I think we're having a pretty healthy debate about NATO. I'm glad we're having a healthy debate now. I just think it's yeah. important for people to understand why we're having this debate now. If, if you and I, if you called me up three years ago and said, Ambassador McFall, I really want to debate whether NATO expansion is a good idea or not, that would have been interesting to me. But you need to ask the serious question, why are we debating it now? It's because Putin put 150,000 troops Agreed. on the border of Ukraine. And, and that is just an important fact to not get Agreed. lost in this long historical debate about, you know, no, no. was it right I, or wrong? And I want to also hundreds. ask the counter... I want to be sure we ask the counterfactual. When people say NATO was a mistake to expand, then you need to ask yourself right now, today, if there had been no NATO expansion, would the crisis only be between Russia and Ukraine, or would it be between Russia and Estonia, and Russia and Latvia, and Russia and Lithuania? That's the counterfactual that the side that says NATO expansion was a bad idea never thinks about. History would have been very different had we not tried to close good, some of that security it's gap. It's a very good question. There. It's a very good question. We are sadly out of time for that counterfactual, but I appreciate you taking part in this healthy debate. It is important that we have these discussions, and I really thank you for coming on the show tonight, and I apologize for the audio issues. Thank you, Ambassador McFall. Oh, still ahead. Right-wing media say there's a huge Clinton campaign scandal lying in plain sight. If only the rest of the media would read John Durham's court filings. Well, we did, and we'll explain it all next. It's not what you think. Fox hosts love to complain about other media outlets, especially ones that, unlike Fox, report news. So what's Fox's latest complaint? Bombshell court filing from late on Friday alleging the Clinton campaign paid a tech company to infiltrate servers 
at both Trump Tower and the White House. You would not know it from watching the news, though. Just about but Jeff Bezos doesn't think you should worry about it or even know that it happened. It's a media blackout. They're not reporting it. America needs to know. This needs to be exposed. It is a huge story. There's crickets in the media. Why? Why isn't the media covering this story? Fox hosts often pose that question. But here's my question. What exactly do they mean by this story? Because Jeff Bezos is Washington Post and the New York Times. And yes, this show just last night led with reporting on the so-called bombshell filing from special counsel John Durham that says a tech firm with ties to a 2016 Clinton campaign lawyer named Michael Sussman monitored internet traffic between Trump Tower and the White House, among other places, and shared that data with Sussman. It says the firm monitored traffic but did not read or compromise any communications. The filing doesn't say which White House administration had its traffic monitored, but a separate filing from attorneys for Sussman said the tracking happened only while Barack Obama was president. So yes, in fact, the mainstream media has covered this story based on the available facts. But that's not the story Fox is telling. As ever, it seems to be writing its own. Here's 7 p.m. last night, Fox. Durham's documents show that Hillary Clinton hired people who hacked into Trump's home and office computers before and during his presidency and planted evidence that he colluded with Russia. Where to begin? This filing does not say that Hillary Clinton hired that tech firm or paid its leaders, Rodney Joffe, for the monitoring. It doesn't mention home or office computers and doesn't say that any hacking took place or that evidence was planted. Multiple false statements, and that's just Fox's first hour of prime time yesterday. Let's go on, 8 p.m. The filing says that Joffe and his computer scientists intercepted internet traffic, that is, emails and presumably text messages. This isn't a conspiracy theory. His claims were true. Democrats were spying on Donald Trump, not just as a candidate, but as president of the United States in the White House, as well as in his own home. Again. No evidence in the filing that Trump was spied on through hacking or other means. The filing doesn't say he was in the White House at the time of the monitoring. Also, where does it say anything about text messages or emails? It doesn't. But 9 p.m. The Clinton campaign paid a tech firm to infiltrate the servers at Trump Tower and then later infiltrate the servers at the Trump White House. And so make no mistake, this is far worse than Watergate. Nope. Infiltrate does not appear in this filing anywhere. Okay, 10 p.m. A bombshell new court filing from special counsel John Durham alleges that the Clinton campaign paid a tech company to surreptitiously monitor computer servers at Trump Tower and even in the executive office of the president. Again, no. The filing does not say that. It does not say the Clinton campaign paid the tech firm. So think about this. If this Durham filing is such a bombshell as Fox says it is, then why do they keep ignoring what's actually in it? Why do they keep sexing it up? And then they keep asking, why is no one covering the story of the filing? Well, plenty of outlets are. The one that actually isn't is Fox. Charlie Savage of The New York Times is one of the reporters covering this story. His piece from Monday is titled, Court Filing Started a Furor in Right-Wing Outlets, but their narrative is off track. Uh, Charlie, thanks for coming on the show tonight. You write that much of the right-wing narrative is factually incorrect, but you also write that many parts of the narrative are old news. Explain that for us. Uh, well, the old news part was the basic thrust of this, that Michael Sussman, this lawyer, is being prosecuted by Durham for making a false statement, allegedly. Uh, in a meeting, uh, had met with the CIA in February of 2017 to convey concerns raised by cybersecurity specialists about certain internet-related data showing that, or suggesting that a very rare in the United States Russian-made smartphone had been connecting to networks inside Trump Tower, inside another building connected to Trump, inside some other places and inside the White House. We had, at The New York Times, reported that in a story about the, uh, related to the Durham investigation in the Michael Sussman case back in October. And so when this filing came out last night, uh, sorry, on, on Friday night, the first read of it is, oh, this information is information that is already out in the wild. It's not some breaking new revelation, uh, the way the right-wing media treated the entire line of inquiry. But then, of course, as you have just ably uh, demonstrated, they began gilding the lily in ways that got more and more hysterical. So 
Fox hosts have invoked Watergate. Donald Trump has suggested evidence of a crime. Is there any sign that Sussman or anyone from the tech firm could face charges stemming from this internet traffic monitoring? It's very unlikely, for one thing. Uh, well, this isn't really monitoring traffic. That's part of, there's, there's a very really technical thing, and I don't think anyone at Fox actually understands the technology at all, which may be a contributing factor here. Uh, but the meeting that this all happened at, uh, this February 2017 meeting, uh, is was just outside of five years old at the time that Durham made this filing. And the statute of limitations for charging something related to that meeting uh, therefore had passed. And therefore, Durham had waited until there was no chance that charges could be brought before he uh, discussed this in the first instance, uh, but doing so in a way that led the uh, the sort of entire right-wing ecosystem and to start running with narratives like uh, spying on the Trump White House when the data in question, according to the people who developed this analysis, involved malware in the Obama White House. They had been asked to look at so after Russia had on that note, the White House in 2015. On that note, Charlie, you mentioned the Obama White House. You've reported that Sussman looked at this internet traffic data, shared it with the CIA in 2017 to suggest possible links between Trump and Russia. But maybe I'm being, maybe I'm confused by all the technical stuff. If the White House internet monitoring happened only during the Obama years, what evidence would that offer about Trump? Well, we have uh, we have Durham's portrayal of this, that they said this entire thing was about Trump. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I think these researchers had found, as they were looking at evidence for mush, Russian uh, malware and malicious activity, targeting American government institutions, targeting people associated with the election, they had uncovered this pattern of Yota phone data. That's the Russian-made smartphone that doesn't really exist in the United States, isn't sold here, is rarely seen here, that th those devices appear to have been connecting to various networks of concern, which included Trump Tower in 2016. But they had also seen evidence of that data in the White House network the Obama White but House it, network. And that is an Obama. important thing, whether or not that part is connected to Trump. That, mean, that suggests someone with a weird Russian phone in his pocket is in the White House. That means seems yes. worthy of discussion. And I think that that- It's not, the, it's uh, not quite the same thing as Sean Hannity saying, they, saying they, it's not quite the same thing as Sean Hannity saying they spied on our president while he was in the Oval Office. Uh, there's no evidence of that in this filing. Sussman was charged last fall for lying in a 2016 FBI meeting about his ties to the Clinton campaign. While this Durham filing does not suggest spying or infiltration by Sussman or the Clinton campaign, is there any evidence that Sussman was trying to create the appearance of wrongdoing by Trump and get the feds to investigate? People are talking about Trump being framed. Well, I mean, it's a little more complicated than that in that Sussman was the lawyer for a technology executive named Rodney Jaffe, who had been working with these cybersecurity uh, researchers. And the cybersecurity researchers had developed these anomalous data they had concerns about and had a theory about and had written up white papers saying, this is odd. What, what could this mean? Is there a sign of a, a Trump tie here or not? And eventually, that paper makes it into Rodney Jaffe's hands, and then it makes it into Michael Sussman's hands, and Sussman takes it to the CIA. But it was not Sussman himself who had developed this theory in the first instance. He is not a cybersecurity engineering expert. He's a lawyer, although he does specialize in cyber issues. So he was not the one who was examining the data or analyzing it and drawing conclusions about it. He was conveying concerns that other people had developed. Charlie, last quick question. You write about how it's covered in right-wing media. You talk about these narratives being based often on a misleading presentation of the facts. They tend to involve dense and obscure issues. Dissecting them requires asking readers to expend significant mental energy and time. What is the solution to that? It's a total dilemma. You're checkmated if you do or don't. So one question is, well, we have uh, control over our own news pages, you have control over your own show, you make decisions about what's it's important for your readers or your viewers to spend their limited time absorbing that day. And so one question, well, we, this doesn't merit coverage, it's just a bunch of garbage, uh, it's more hot air, uh, and it would take a lot of time that they could spend reading about something that's real to ask them to ex understand this and work through it when the payoff is, therefore, nothing to see here. But if you don't cover it, if you just say meh, then the yeah. whole sort of Trump world ecosystem says, oh, the media is engaged in a cover up. See, the media is part yes. of the conspiracy. And you're, there's no win, basically. There is no win. There is no win. But all we can do is keep doing what we're doing. Charlie Savage, thank you for your reporting. Appreciate it.
Yesterday on this show, we marked four years since the school shooting in Parkland, Florida. But today we have at least a measure of some justice for the families of victims in the Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre. Relatives of nine of the victims reached a $73 million settlement with the gun manufacturer Remington, which made the Bushmaster AR-15 style rifle used in the shooting. But while this isn't the first lawsuit brought against a gun manufacturer in the U.S. for the violence caused by the weapons they produce, it is the first to result in any sort of settlement. The reason for this is a law passed in 2005 that provides gun manufacturers immunity from nearly all civil liability claims. Most cases like these are dismissed because of it. But in 2019, the Supreme Court allowed this suit to proceed because the victims' families argued that Remington irresponsibly marketed the gun to at-risk young men, like the Sandy Hook shooter. That apparently was not covered by the 2005 law. Remington denies the allegations in the lawsuit, but today... Finally, there has been a cost exacted from the manufacturer of a weapon that took the lives of so many innocent people. Whether more manufacturers will be held accountable is unclear, but it's a first step. Still ahead, an author takes us back in time, thousands of years ago when the very first human beings set foot in the Americas. The latest science is upending the story you think you know. We'll share those surprising findings when we return. Don't go away. The coronavirus pandemic has given us a real-time look at how scientific understanding can evolve over time. For example, over the last two years, Dr. Anthony Fauci has shifted his own guidance on wearing masks as the data on how the virus spread became clearer. As we learn more about this virus, of course, old knowledge will appear outdated. It's as true in the field of public health as it is in any other scientific endeavor, even in the study of human origins. But as author and anthropologist Jennifer Raff argues, this is a feature, not a bug, of the scientific method. All scientists must hold themselves open to the possibility that we could be wrong. And it may very well be that in 5, 10 or 20 years, this book will be as out of date as any other. That possibility is what makes working in this field so rewarding. Raff's new book, Origin, A Genetic History of the Americas, introduces many new possibilities about how humans first came to the Americas. She challenges the long-standing Clovis First model, the theory that the peopling of the Americas occurred around 13,000 years ago when a small group crossed the Bering Land Bridge from Northeast Asia to Northwestern Alaska. In combining geology, archaeology, genetics, and even the oral histories of indigenous people, Raff explores the possibility that this continent was populated five to 10,000 years earlier, before the Clovis cultures arrived. Unfortunately, as she points out, the history of indigenous people has largely been marginalized and overshadowed by colonial history. She hopes to help change that. And joining me now to discuss all of this is Jennifer Raff, author of Origin, A Genetic History of the Americas and professor of anthropology at the University of Kansas. Thank you so much for coming on the show. A fascinating book. You mentioned in the introduction that you're of Polish, Irish and English descent and that your own ancestors didn't come to America until the 20th century. How did you come to study this subject? Oh, well, I've been interested in genetics and archaeology since I was a kid. And uh, to date myself a little bit, um, Jurassic Park came out when I was in high school. And <laughs> I learned that one could study ancient DNA and combine these two fields, which I love. So let's talk about this Clovis first model that humans arrived in the Americas 10,000 years ago, which you kind of uh, push back against. Why has it been so persistent? So it has been persistent, but I want to stress that it's not really been the major theme of the field or the major understanding of the field for at least a decade, maybe two. It's just that in the minds of the public, this idea has persisted for so long, largely, I think, because we have learned it in school, at least if you're my age or older, this is the story you learned in school. And they don't teach anthropology very much in school, um, in, at least in the uh, junior grades. And so I think that uh, people have to update their understandings and understand that the, that the indigenous inhabitants of the Americas, the Native Americans have been here far, far longer than most people realize. Yes, and you write, expunging native histories from the broader narrative has been a crucial part of the larger strategy to discount the validity of age-old native rights to lands the settlers wanted. A greater awareness of the histories of indigenous peoples won't fix these issues alone, but it is an important step in itself. How would you like to see this history now taught? So 
I think that one thing that's really important is to understand archaeology as a process and genetics as a process. This is true of all science in general, that we need to not rely just on fixed facts, but instead an understanding of how science evolves. When new information is presented, how do we integrate it into our, into our existing models? or what aspects of those models need to change. And the peopling of the Americas is one really good example of this. We now know from genetics uh, evidence that the ancestors of Native Americans were isolated for several thousand years. We don't know where that isolation took place, but we have some suspicions that it might have been, perhaps, in the southern coast of the Bering Land Bridge, or Beringia, which was actually not a small isthmus of land that connected the two continents, but instead was really um, a, I like to think of it as a lost continent. It was really a large landmass, like twice the size of Texas. And in areas wow. there, there may have been refugia where people took shelter from the global cooling and uh, drying period known as the last glacial maximum. We need to leverage archaeological evidence now to see if we can figure out where that population was. In recent years, we've seen Christopher Columbus statues being taken down. Columbus Day rebranded as Indigenous Peoples Day. Do you see any progress there? Yes, I'm one of those people who understands or believes that history is uh, really an evolving understanding. So we need to make sure that when we're lauding a certain person, <laughs> we need to understand what we're uh, lauding them for. And as we come to understand history a bit better, Many people say that it's very important to question these um, these figures. And certainly the colonists who uh, treated Native Americans with such disrespect, such brutality, that's not a praiseworthy thing. We don't need to honor them in that way. During the pandemic, Dr. Raff, we've seen how dangerous it can be for people to distrust the scientific community. At the same time, you detail horrific abuses perpetrated by scientists against indigenous people. Uh, how do we confront the failures of the scientific community without also dangerously degrading public trust in science more broadly? Well, I think we need to have an open and honest conversation as scientists to each other and as scientists with the public. I think we need to be honest about um, the shortcomings of our discipline and the places where we've screwed up, frankly. And we need to listen to the perspectives of indigenous peoples who are not scientists and indigenous peoples who are scientists. Those of us who are non-indigenous have a lot to learn about uh, ways to take this field forward in a respectful and productive way. And I think this conversation is going to be healthy as long as it's honest and open. Quick last question. What was the most surprising thing you discovered writing this book? Well, the most surprising thing, I think, was the White Sand site, which has recently been discovered um, in New Mexico. And this site may date to as early as 26,000 years ago. Archaeologists are still a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of controversy right now. But if this site is true, if people were in the Americas 26,000 years ago, we have to reconsider some of our models and incorporate this new evidence into them and understand the antiquity of people, how long people really have been here in North America. Thank you so much for that. It's a fascinating conversation and a fascinating book. I uh, appreciate you taking time out, Jennifer Raff. Thank you so much. Before we go tonight, tennis star Novak Djokovic wants you to know he is willing to suffer. Suffer having been deported from Australia last month for failing to meet the requirements of the medical exemption he'd sought to enter that country unvaccinated. Today, Djokovic said he's willing to skip the French Open and Wimbledon too, where he was likely to meet the same problems, including detention. Did you feel powerless? Yes, I did feel powerless. I, when I arrived, I, you know, I was not allowed to use my phone for three, four hours. It was the middle of the night from 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, didn't get any sleep. Sad face emoji. You know what? Let Djokovic complain about the conditions he was held in and the trophies he isn't winning and his fellow players who don't support him. As I see it, Djokovic can either be a sore loser for months, if not years, because of his anti-COVID vaccination stance, or, or 
he can get jabbed and have a sore arm for a day or two at most. That does it for me tonight. Make sure to join us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook, and I'll see you back here on the TV tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern, live right here on The Choice from MSNBC. For now, from me, good night. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of The Mehdi Hassan Show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen, and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.